Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another Microsoft Buzz Chat interview, and I'm here today with Mr. Chris Slemp. Hey, Chris. Hi. So, folks that don't know you, why don't you introduce yourself, who you are, where you are, what you do. Okay, well, so this is profiling Microsoft employees, right? So, yeah. I guess I ought to talk about my Microsoft creds, I suppose. Uh, I've been at Microsoft about 20 years, so this is my first real job really out of out of college um but i think most people know me as probably one of the biggest yammer fans in the world um because <laughs> i was i was running the microsoft yammer network for about four years there um i took um i took two years out and i think that's about where we met right christian yeah i think we years. ran into each other while you were doing the network stuff and for folks okay. that don't remember too is that after the acquisition and Microsoft had various community activities in different places, and they kind of pushed all of that activity over into Yammer. And a lot of those communities are still there and thriving and doing well. But of course, then they went, they wanted to expand beyond that. They built out the tech community, um, which is on a completely different non-Microsoft technology yeah. platform. <laughs> yeah. We won't don't, don't, don't don't send me down that path. I, yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but anyway, yeah. So you were you were gone for a while. So you you went out into industry. I had the yeah. I had the startup itch and uh, and and scratched it good. So um, so I was with Carpool Agency for a couple of years, and uh, and I learned a massive amount in two years, and I'm so thankful for that that bunch there. Uh, Jeremy and the gang. Um, I, I learned a ton. Um, but uh, as circumstances changed. I found an opportunity. This was actually so being a customer success manager, which is my current title, um, is something I had been coveting for years. So since I first met the Yammer team, they had customer success managers. And I just loved the concept of the role. It was kind of that sweet spot between techie and customer facing and that I just really loved. And so I kind of fashioned my role within Microsoft to be like that uh, for, you know, for Microsoft employees, essentially. You know, it's interesting is that actually came up uh, in a tweet jam today, conversation talking about how, uh, you know, with the COVID quarantine going on and, and the work from home that it, it has really, again, surface the reality is that organizations need to have that CSM yep. function. Yep. Uh, it is just so important. There's, you can't just go and, uh, and maybe you could give us a little background of what that role is and how you do oh, yeah. it. Because I, my point that I made in that discussion was you cannot simply rely on the tools to put in security protocols and compliance and then just assume that, hey, everything is gonna, gonna work. You know, right. There's right. Humans involved. Well, and, and not and not just that it just works, but that uh, that people are actually going to use it, right? right? So and get the most value out of it. So, you know, I mean, let's. So we can actually fast forward a little bit to what I'm doing now, because uh, it kind of best explains it. So um, I found found a position. They had they created a bunch of these customer success manager positions all over the world, uh, back about almost three years ago now. And uh, my wife is Scottish. There was a position in based in London, but I said, hey, can I live in Scotland? They said, that'd be awesome. And so here I am. So what I'm doing is looking after all the public sector customers that we have in Scotland. That's kind of my remit. And uh, with my kind of um, hero customer right now being the NHS for obvious reasons. So that, that's the National Health Service here. So. Um, so my job is to make sure that they are using everything that they own. And most people, so I'll get back to where I had, why I headed down this path, let's be honest, most of these people, especially in the public sector, were buying Office 365 to get cheaper email, right? And it was just cheaper to, to run it on exchange right. online you know, than it was on premise. Email, and most people that don't know that too, that are kind of uh, latecomers on the, the cycle, but yeah, email was for years was the primary motivation for organizations to move over to Office 365. Right, right. And, so. and to be honest, that hadn't changed very much, especially in, in cash-strapped organizations that, hmm, 
how, how to say this delicately, um, weren't particularly innovative, right? They were, so a lot of folks in public sector, like they're just trying to get their job done and trying to do it efficiently and they do hero work, don't get me wrong, but they're very cost conscious. And, and so that's really what they were trying to do in a lot of senses. COVID has changed all that. So um, this has been another wake up call to them to say, wow, we, we need to, we, we have to transform. We're being forced to transform. And some of them don't even know what that means or looks like right now. And so my role is, isn't really about technology. I spend a lot of time talking about it and helping them through that and training and those kinds of things. But it's really the people side of the change. It's the culture change. It's the mindset shift. It's the, you know, how do we, I, I host hackathons, right, at, at a customer site. You know, bring customers in and say, kick IT out of the room. Or if you can, you know, you want to be a wallflower and watch, that's great. But let's get the business people around, show them the basics of how to use some of the toolbox and turn them loose and say, okay, what is, what are the business problems you're facing? Let's focus on the business problems and let that lead the conversation, not the tools. Yeah. It's all about the tech intensity. <laughs> Just so, you know, I, I know I, that's, I know Satya Nadella brought that up, but we had the, the partner conference, uh, you know, earlier this month. And, uh, so that was the new verbiage, the, the new term that used, which is really kind of the, you know, his, uh, uh, Satya's description of the kind of the evolution of the the business transformation. You know what what you're talking about. It's yeah. uh, getting it's it's beyond just hey deploy it and we have these other tools. But to get people thinking about you know the individual or team based transformation, how do we start leveraging this to do more, to do it faster, to do it better? Yeah. Um, so so really starting to. Uh, uh, you know, not, not just expect IT to come in, put something new on my system and then mm -hmm. back away. And I just, I figure things out, but otherwise work the way that I've always worked, right. but to, to really embrace the transformation. Yeah. Well, if you want, if you want a new, uh, such a buzzword, um, or buzz phrase, uh, this, this is what we're talking about, um, most often right now, but I do love it because it speaks to my role so well. So what he talks about now is respond to this, this crisis, right? Respond, recover, and reimagine. So people get, they, they get it, right? When you're saying, okay, I got to respond. I got to react. I've got to turn on teams where I was dragging my feet before. I've got to turn these things on to respond to what's happening here. To people needing to work at home. Now we need to recover. So now we need to kind of make sure that we're doing it right, make sure we got security in place, make sure we got our governance in place, those kinds of things. Um, but now we have an opportunity to reimagine as well because there's a new normal. And we're, not even, we're still not even sure what that looks like, but we need to be able to reimagine, really think differently about the way we've done business. Yeah, which makes sense uh, you know, for years and years. And as you know, my, my background in the SharePoint space and working with migration and administration tools with these, these ISVs, we'd always talk to clients about this to say, look, it's not just a, the, the term that's used in the industry is the lift and shift. It's right. not just moving what was broken, worked okay, but not optimized over to the new stuff, but still not quite working, not optimized for that. You look at a migration as an opportunity to go in and relook at your data, relook at your governance, your compliance, your security, kind of all those aspects. Are we meeting uh, our, our needs there? What is our change management policies around this? Um, but then to also go and look and say, okay, this is how we're doing it today. Is this the best way of doing it? Are we fully yeah. leveraging the technology that we – so – yeah. What's interesting, Chris, and I, I know, I think we've actually talked about this years ago. Um, I started my career as a business analyst. One of the things I used to always talk when I, early on as I started presenting, uh, going around to conferences, I would talk about some of those earlier, the early experiences as a BA. But I'd say, well, where, when's the right time to, uh, to introduce new technology when you're trying to define business outcomes and, and, and capture requirements with a customer group? Because if you ask them for the requirements without them being aware of the new technology that you're thinking about implementing, then they'll give you their requirements through the lens of their current understanding of what the yeah. system can and cannot do. 
But the opposite is that if you show them all the new stuff and you ask them for their requirements and then they start dreaming up all of these scenarios, which may not be, you know, anchored in reality of what they actually need, what will actually improve. And the right answer, you know, is, is there can be a right answer. It's more of an iterative approach to those things to move people through. It's, it's the define what it is. Here's what, here's how we improve this get them up to that new level and say, all right, now based on your answer where this is, let me show you what else we could do. Have you, let's start exploring kind of the next phase. I mean, I, mean, I look a lot of the CSM role as that. As yeah. It's a BA function in some regard. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say so. I think, um, I think we do try to get up to a more strategic level, right? To, to say how, you know, so uh, Power Platform is a great example, right? Um, so I, mean, I was thinking about this earlier when you were saying, um, you know, how we, we think of what we currently have, our legacy, our legacy, and we just want to lift and shift and, and move it in rather than rethink it. One of the classic examples is, you know, an organization I was talking to that said, oh, well, we can't, we're having trouble moving to Windows 10 because um, we, uh, have to consider all these legacy access databases or something, or something about access databases. <laughs> uh, there is a new way <laughs> of doing this, and but it, it's a in some cases it is a big leap, right? So you know because they haven't they spent a lot of the money. I have the latest access updates. What are you talking about? That's that's the latest tech technology, Chris. I'm sure there are still use cases for access. Really man, I'm sure there are. But um yeah, but they've spent so much time and money and effort in maintaining these databases that are sitting on people's machines that they don't see if they could um just redirect those funds. So they think of, for example, the C, you know, investing in the CDS and the whole the common data store behind Power Platform, right? So they think of that as a net new investment when really it should be completely changed. They shouldn't be investing any of the time in the local access databases and instead doing this common data store. Or the new rebrand, the, the new Dataflex, yeah. The, uh, yeah, the, yeah but, <laughs> What, come data store? What are you talking about? I don't, I don't understand that. As soon as I heard hear the new product name, I the the old names are dead to me, and I just I don't recognize them anymore. So it's not confusing at all to people. Drinking the Kool Aid well. Yeah, but it's no, it's uh, yeah, it, right. It's it's. Uh, I mean, look, there, there's always you know, I, I moved from a BA early on to into the PM function and that, you yeah. know, the difference between those where the, a, a business analyst is focused largely on understanding what the business needs are, understanding what the technical capabilities are and helping the business to, uh, to, to envision what could be and then to move into that point where a PM's function is much more of the work with the BA, there's the plan of attack, Make sure yeah. that that first phase, which we said would be in six weeks, ends in six weeks, on time, on budget, everybody on board, meet all the outcomes, and then we move on to the next phase. Yeah. Um, but part I of guess, that, go ahead. Yeah, well, one of the big differences between a, a BA role and a CSM role, uh, for anybody who's interested in the, in the career path, um, is that a CSM has... So we sit in a sales organization. That's not true with for every enterprise that, that does this role, but we do. We do, we're not metric on sales, however, but we are. We do carry a goal, like we carry a metric that we have to hit, and that's not generally true of a business analyst, which is much more of a, a cost center kind of function. Right. So, so for a CSM, we're actually metric on how many people we get using you know, the right. different workloads. Yeah, that's it, so, which is, I mean, look, I, I always, I mean, I carry the title of, you know, evangelist, of technology evangelist for years. And I, when I looked at the CSM role, I said, in a lot of ways, it's a very different ways. I mean, evangelism yeah, yeah. is probably more on the business development side of, of things, kind of mm -hmm. between quasi, between product, sales, marketing, operations. Right. But, um, you know, I, I, I think it was more akin to the CSM role just on in a in a different space, but you know, same same kind of thing. It's it's um, yeah. Anyway, I I think as people are, you know, 
thinking about these different roles. You can't get hung up on the titles or where it sits exactly. And, and that's why I say there's a need for a CSM type function, whether yeah. that person sits in support. Um, I, I've seen them sit in training and leadership development in larger organizations. And then there's other organizations where they could be an office manager slash marketing person slash CSM. If they're in a smaller place, they're doing kind of all of those different roles. Sure. The important thing is that you have somebody that's looking at that and asking those questions of, you know, are we getting the most out of what we have in place? How can we improve? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it takes a, a certain, um, so good CSMs have a high need to help people. So, um, so that's why a lot of times the, they'll be aligned to su support and, uh, and we've actually just done a, uh, an alignment internally to bring more support resources closely aligned to the CSU. So there you go. But um, so uh, where was I going with that? Yeah, I, I just, to your point about don't get hung up on, on titles, I, I just know what drives me and it's problem solving, trying to help somebody be successful. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I kind of, I lean technical, but I'm not a coder. I've tried that. I know, I know I'm not that. So I try to stay in that sweet, in that sweet spot. So, yeah. So it's a, it's a good place to be. I mean, the, the Microsoft space, look, there's obviously you still have with build and the dev focus and there's, you know, it, you know, Satya again, a couple years ago, like, you know, every company is a software company mm -hmm. because you need to go in and, and, and a lot of that is the, you know, that with the power platform, a lot of these, power user, um, some are referring to them as, uh, uh, rather than power user, as kind of makers, that mm -hmm. maker you know, way of thinking of go and solve problems on your own. I mean, look, I've worked in companies, I worked years ago with, with Cisco and others where a business analyst was a very senior role and they were going in and building, uh, uh, you know, piloting. They were doing a lot of that, you know, just one step below the engineering team and kind of build out the solution. So they hand over something that is, you know, two thirds of the way complete and saying, go make this so that it scales and can be supported across the organization. But here's what it will look like. And, and I've piloted out and this should be correct. Um, so again, it's a, uh, you know, I, just because I've worn the BA title and not formally the CSM, I refer to that, but, it, but like you said, it's, it, it, regardless of the of the title, it's kind of the you know, hear the functions and I, it's, yeah. it's very very similar. But well, interesting. So it, it's may, maybe you could talk about you know the the shift inside Microsoft around this role because I know you had like the DE or DX team and you had a lot of people that had evangelism in their title. Those went away. Some have kind of snuck back in. Um, CSMs. Like famously, you might not know about this if you're watching that, you know, that like the CSM unit that was originally came from the Yammer organization, but they were like cut across the board and people found other roles. But now you have people that have CSM titles back in the company. So kind of what's happening? What's, what, what's been the learning inside of my, so I, I, you know, I, there are legends, so I'm not, I, you know, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to throw out names or, or things that where I don't have hard concrete evidence, but I, so essentially what happened from my point of view is that the, the CSM role had a hard time finding a home within the office world where it started with from the Yammer acquisition, right? It's having a hard time finding a home organizationally within Microsoft to set it up for success um, because they were continually kind of moved from one cost center essentially to another, you know, whether it was sales and marketing or part of the engineering team or they couldn't really find a place for it. And that's, I think ultimately why it was just completely disbanded because they just couldn't justify they, they couldn't tie it to some concrete value, right? They, they couldn't figure this out. Right. Somewhere along the line, um, and, and, and by the way, that was kind of, because I loved that role so much, when they disbanded that team, that was the last straw for me. I was kind of figuring out whether I wanted to stay at Microsoft or what I wanted to do. When they did that, I'm like, nope, done, because that's what I was going to do. So I thought they had just lost uh, interest in it. So, but somewhere in that two years that I was out, someone joined and that's where 
I could take some guesses, but I'm not sure who exactly. Someone got religion basically around customer success and they realized that in a consumption world, we have to have somebody working directly with our customers that is gold on and focused on consumption or we're going to start, they're going to start peeling away to Google and, and Salesforce and whoever. Right. So, um, so they, they finally got it and created this massive organization kind of all at once. Um, and so, and that was massively disruptive to the whole field organization, trying to figure out how that role and, and a consumption rhythm fits with a sales rhythm. Um, and so there's been some growing pains for the last couple of years, but, um, but yeah, I think we're in a pretty solid space right now. And, um, you know, Amy Hood frequently making reference to customer success and how important that is and all of that in her keynotes and things. So we feel like we get it and, uh, and we're in a good place. That's great. You know, because it certainly wasn't being on the outside too, being mm -hmm. part of the partner community, uh, you know, it, you know, looking in when they made that decision and, and over that, that time, it's great they figure something. As you know, there were some people that remained inside of Microsoft and went into other roles, but were still kind of doing that same thing yeah. and then yeah. kind of come back into that. But it's, it's in the DNA, man. <laughs> but it's one of those things, I think, from the outside where we, like, I think we all called it. You know, we're like, Microsoft, you're making a mistake. It's needed. Yeah. Like, I get it. If it's not tied to, specific you know kpis and if they can't measure it you know and, and i just think that they took the extreme decision without really thinking it through there there's a I mean, which which happens and and they've learned from that and they've you know and it may be that that the end goal that they finally reach do a smooth transition they just needed to cut and start over and you know fully plan it i, I don't know i don't know that piece how the transition happened i'm just glad it did yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 all good. It's you, you know that change is happening within Microsoft. I mean, one of the indicators, and I hear I'm wearing my, uh, you know, the, I had like the, the partner discussions and stuff this morning, wearing my Bill T-shirt. Um, you know, we were we were talking about how you, you know when change is happening inside of Microsoft is you look at what they share publicly about like what the uh, commitments are at the individual yeah. and team level after the fifth when the start of the fiscal year when the internal meetings have happened and they've said, okay, for the next fiscal year, here's what we're focusing on. And when they started focusing on uh, consumption and adoption and other metrics, which you know, were foreign for all the time and, and, and being part of the original, the, the, the back towards the start of what is now Office 365. And you know, when I joined in 2006, was there for three and a half years and kept saying, you know, you're, you're focusing on selling the net new licenses when they renew their EAAs, they're not going to renew because they're not using it. There's not, not seeing the value. It's going to hurt us. We need to help them to utilize what they have. Yep. And it took a while. So when you started to see those metrics, you know, on the, the uh, metrics for salespeople and the CSMs and, and all this, I, I think it was and in the product team as well. It's not just about like, here's the five new features that I helped launch in the last year. It's the what's the data showing? Are people actually using this? Are we building the things that people are actually finding and using, uh, which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and it, you know, and it get, allows me to focus on on what I want to focus on, which is solving people's problems and not worrying about the, the sale. Right, I, I can do the right thing for them. Right. So. Well. Cool. So I know that, uh, so you're in a beautiful part of the world. Um, I am very envious of that. I love it up there. Uh, I, I was thinking of you just an hour ago um, when I was having a, uh, an epic fish and chips supper. So uh, <laughs> oh, love that. You know, with a, a real piece of fish. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure. No, and for people that not, don't understand. Not the fish and chips you get in the States. Like, no. Nah. So I was in, uh, so one, I just did to my bona fides here is that my, uh, my maternal side of the family, there were uh, my, so my grand, my maternal grandfather, Richardson, 15 generations did not move from Edinburgh. So <laughs> oh, like, wow, there you go. Backed, backed 15 generations, uh, my 14th great grandfather, or whatever, or 15th great grand, so like, you know, more than that, whatever, changed the name from Rikerson to Richardson. I don't know why. Need to go and dig into that. 
Um, but love the area. As you know, I, I mean, we lived in Seattle for 12 years. And so some similar weather patterns and stuff. I love that. I appreciate that. But the last time I was there uh, with my good friend, Mike Watson, who was living there in Edinburgh, and we did, uh, we drove up north and he was in the process of renewing his license. So I had no license. So I had to drive um, some narrow roads up in that part of the world. Yes. 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 But we went up into the, you know, up into the, the, the locks and drove around and it was just, just amazing. Uh, yeah. Loved it. Loved it. Yep. And uh, would love Yeah, it. no, people, uh, you know, for the first several years, people would ask me what I miss about the States. And honestly, I mean, there, there's food things I could go into, you know, I don't want to bore everybody. The, the one thing, the answer that interests most people, which is the honest truth, is the main thing I miss the most is wide, well-maintained roads. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, hey, I, look, I, I so I live in, you know, in Lehigh, Utah. And as you know, how oh. wide the roads are here. It, yeah. Every time I go to like Seattle or something, I complain, these roads are so narrow. Yeah, no, 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 Everything, for people that don't know, too, in, in Utah, the roads are really wide because when they developed the area, it was it, uh, like it, when they started, the pioneers came over. It was after the first of several Chicago fires, big city fires. So they built them extra wide, not because they envisioned the future traffic. It was fire breaks. It was. I did not future. know that, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. they learned those lessons in the city planning and it yeah. just worked out that you have like six lane roads yeah. and greater in downtown Salt Lake City is because yeah. of a lot of those they lessons. Planned it that way from the Chicago. Wow. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Well, well, great. Well, Chris, you know, people want to find out more about you, get in touch with you. How do they find you? Are you doing stuff in the socials? You know, it's, it has definitely uh, decreased lately. I have to be honest with you. It's just, just been, it's been manic, uh, you know, learning a whole new, actually adjusting to working in the field in the Microsoft field was even a bigger adjustment than working to a new country. Oh, yeah. <laughs> adjusting to a new country. Yeah. It, it's I a, heard it's very different. It's a totally different world. So, and, and there are people um, that are in the long time in the field at Microsoft and they go over to corporate and they're like, I don't like this. And yeah. they want to get back in the field. Yeah. It's just, it's a different personality. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, um, but I am more active on LinkedIn now than I am on Twitter. So, um, so just search. I don't think there's too many Chris Lumps on, on, uh, on LinkedIn. So uh, you'll be able to find me there. And, um, but I am on Twitter. So that's uh, CSLEMP. Excellent. Well, hey, really appreciate your time today and enjoy the rest of your evening. Is it raining or windy today or is it? it you know, it is uh, rainy, very gray today, but we're expecting uh, 80 degrees almost tomorrow. So oh, don't say that. Yeah. I like the rainy and windy part. I, I like that. <laughs> we, get, we get a day of summer and then it's back. To <laughs> yeah, no, I, I look, I've been there in the summer and just beautiful. Uh, I, I, I prefer that, but uh, you all enjoy the countryside there. I know I, I, I very envious. I look at the pictures when you guys get out and travel and post stuff to the socials. So um, go, go have some fun, but uh, thanks a lot for your time today. Yeah. Well, likewise.